Well, hello everyone, happy Wednesday. Uh, it is great to see everyone here today and thank you for joining us on our webinar as we prepare for a big event on Friday, July 8th. And this webinar is to talk about healing and empowering community through aquatics. And uh, we have been fortunate to be joined by our partners here. Uh, of course, everybody knows we have a partnership with USA Swimming and we thank USA Swimming for allowing us for to do this. And then the call to action leading the way with the City Swim Project, the executive director, coach, Mike Satowski. So thank you all for being a part of this. We have a number of people that are a part of this panel discussion who will be giving um, all the ins and outs about this community event, a little bit of the history of Buffalo, and then talking about blue mindfulness as a way to build bridges with community. And so I'm gonna hand it over and start with introductions. My name is Dr. Miriam Lynch. I serve as the privilege of being the executive director of this amazing organization, Diversity in Aquatics. I'm gonna hand it over to my fellow executive director, Coach Mike. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Swatalski. I am not only the executive director of the City Swim Project, but I also am a uh, phys ed teacher in Buffalo Public Schools. Um, turning it over to Dr. Carol Penn. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Carol Penn. I am a doubly board certified family medicine physician and obesity medicine specialist, as well as a movement mindset and meditation coach. I'm so happy to be here this evening representing the state of New Jersey, my company, Penn Global Visions, and uh, I will pass it on to my colleague, Dina Adler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dina. I'm an art therapist, and I also am in faculty and certified practitioner from the Center for Mind Body Medicine. And I'm joining here through my good friend uh, Carol and Thaddeus, especially um, in the healing part of uh, all that goes in behind the scenes, maybe with swimming as well uh, fear, um, hope, courage and finding various ways through breath, movement, art, um, to really make this um, a really powered experience. Um, and also, I live in Rochester, New York, so I've done a lot of work with families in Buffalo. So coming here, too, with just my heart in the community and for community building. Thank you. And so I'm going to pass it off to Thaddeus. Thank you, Dina. I'm Thaddeus Gamery. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and projects and partnerships for diversity in aquatics. I'm a training faculty member with the Center for Mind Body Medicine. I'm a USA swimming coach, a high school swimming coach. And uh, I'm also the president of the Swims Foundation. I'm a retired New York City police lieutenant and working with water and using it as a vehicle for healing and connecting and restoring has been part of my personal journey and also now my professional journey, working with and learning from all the collection of experts and researchers and talented folks that I've met through the Diversity and Aquatics Network and all the additionally all the amazing and talented folks that are on the healing practitioner side, working with the Center for Mind Body Medicine. I'm also a member of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. I'm on their health and wellness committee, and we delivered a blue mindfulness water experience in the Bronx, New York, for the members of the New York City chapter, predominantly the NYPD, but also included the fire department. It included corrections. It included a collection of first responder organizations, and we did it at my old high school just three weeks ago. I think it's no, it's uh, four weeks ago. So I'm looking forward to um, sharing what we have. Uh, developed over the years, how we've connected water to healing, to mindfulness, and how the science is so, so neatly fits and the cultural mind-body-spirit connection is there. And we just want to facilitate that. 
for everyone. And I will pass it on to Noah. Good evening, everyone. I am Noah Wilson. I am the DEI coordinator at USA Swimming. Um, and I was a swimmer for about 10 years. I swam collegiately uh, at Emory and Henry College at the Division II level. And I will pass it off to Leland. Hi, everybody. My name is Leland Brown III. I'm the Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at USA Swimming. And my job, uh, although complex, is simple. To connect, uh, to accept the needs of all others around us, and ultimately to provide in every way that we can. Providing equity, uh, inclusion, uh, and also championing all of the diverse voices around us. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Again, I'm the Director for Diversity at USA Swimming. Uh, and happy that we get to share this space with all of the change agents, the barrier breakers, and world shakers in front of us, uh, like Dr. Miriam Lynch, uh, Mike Swatowski, Dr. Carol Penn, Thaddeus, uh, Dina, and the others. Uh, I just thank you for allowing me to grace the space um, because the work that you're doing is impactful, uh, it's immense, and more importantly, it's needed. <laughs> All right, we're jamming already. So uh, as I said, this was, this is being recorded and you can find all the information on our YouTube channel uh, for diversity and aquatics. And to lay the groundwork for today, this is a moment that when I had a chance to talk to Coach Mike, uh, I've known Coach Mike for, I think we're going on 10 years now, uh, since he started in DEI efforts and the growth of his program, now called the City Swim Project, has been amazing. And when we had a chance to sit down and talk about this, I did not realize all the different events that have happened um, in Buffalo. Um, of course, we all know about May 14th, but I'm going to have Mike, you lay the groundwork for this call of action that we are all here today in support of. Thanks, Miriam. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, I'm a phys ed teacher in the city of Buffalo. And for anybody that's on this call that is uh, in Buffalo, I, I teach at McKinley High School. And uh, at McKinley, we have had a series of tragedies over the course of this year, even well before what everybody probably knows from that happened on February 9th with a security guard being shot and a student being stabbed 10 times. But it really started in August of this year with a, a high school senior being murdered. Uh, and then a few, uh, about two weeks later, one of our teachers passed away. Um, so we were dealt with tragedies, you know, um, you know, within our student body and within the teaching ranks at our school early on this year. And uh, then February 9th happened. Uh, those that are in Buffalo with the, are familiar with the stabbing and shooting of, that happened there. Then in early May, we had a second student go missing. Uh, then May 14th happened with the, the tragedy of the massacre at Tops. And then at the end of May, we learned that uh, the student that went missing was found cut up in a suitcase. And we, um, you know, both were seniors. Uh, the young lady that, that uh, vanished in May, I had all four years. Uh, she was my student in my classes. So I had a relationship with this young lady more than I knew the other young lady that uh, passed away. So um, I, I saw the suffering in the eyes of our kids, the pain, uh, also in the eyes of our faculty as well. And I knew that something needed to be done. So I started the conversation reaching out to USA Swimming with Joel Shinnefield and uh, the conversation with Leland Brown, who's on this call this evening. And uh, we started to develop the idea. Leland was kind enough to, to bring Miriam and Thaddeus into the mix. And it just snowballed from there to what we're excited will be happening on Friday. Uh, Friday looks like a fantastic event. We looks like we're going to have somewhere between 10 and 15 vendors participating, uh, you know, providing their services and their resources to the community. Uh, and then 
We're going to be doing our thing that we always do with swim lessons. And Thaddeus is going to be doing his thing with, uh, you know, Blue Mindfulness uh, in collaboration with Dr. Penn and, and Dina. And uh, we're looking forward to a great event that way. And hopefully we can get this healing process, you know, moving. So that's, uh, that's the reason why I tried to bring all this together. Absolutely. And thank you, Mike. And first off and foremost is that just to understand how much trauma has happened in the community and being able to utilize the resources to get involved and to get organizations together um, with this to, to help a community to see beyond just the pool being aquatics and, and just for lap swimming, but to really be a part and your greater vision and what you and Leland laid the groundwork for is a, a chance for the community to come together um, and have a safe space uh, to address all that has been happening in this community um, and not just be a checkpoint um, along the timeline. And so I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Leland Brown III to talk about that partnership and more about that um, bringing everyone together. Hi there, everybody. So thank you so much, Miriam, for allowing me to talk about partnerships and bringing people together in the space. Um, this all goes back to when we launched together um, the Celebration Bowl. We launched the HBCU grants uh, together at our Celebration Bowl in 2000 and what now 21. It's already right midway, halfway past 2022. But when we launched that, uh, one of the large things that we launched with our partnership with Diversity and Aquatics was creating what we called swim ecosystems, ecosystems that started in not just competitive swim, but started in connecting people to the water, giving them a reason to be in the water, and then teaching them the essential skills of being around the water, from training uh, to competition to things like a, a kick turn to things like the difference between a freestyle and a breaststroke and the like. And so uh, the, the partnership in its totality is really looking at all areas and facets of USA Swimming, but more importantly, the greater diverse aquatics community um, to connect and also understand that we can make more change than just in the competitive swimming landscape. So our partnership goes beyond just club swimming. It looks at aquatics in its totality, looks at the challenges and the barriers that exist there for women, for those that are LGBTQ, for those that are diverse racially, ethnically, um, and ultimately tries to figure out where we can provide. Earlier you said, uh, you heard me say that DEI or diversity, inclusion, and equity at USA Swimming means connecting with others, accepting what they need, and then ultimately providing. So that's what we do with DIA, and that's what Mike does with his community in Buffalo, and we are just a part of the puzzle piece of connecting with the communities, accepting their needs, and providing. And so I am glad that USA Swimming has the partnership with Diversity in Aquatics, because Diversity in Aquatics allows us to have a larger understanding of the landscape of aquatics and not just swimming. Um, figuring out the challenges that are that exist within training and certifications. It's figuring out the challenges that, that exist for uh, those that are racially, racially or ethnically diverse. Figuring out the challenges that exist for other sports outside of swimming, like maybe water polo um, and, and, and or the nutrition deficits that's happening in our community that's keeping kids from uh, the pool. And so I say all of that to say this partnership is not only essential, it's quintessential um, because we we all see the challenges of our communities from different vantage points. And diversity in aquatics sees a different national landscape lens. Mike sees a local landscape lens and USA Swimming sees also a national landscape lens within the, the uh, area of swimming. And so us all coming together um, not only strengthens our partnership, but it allows us all to grow uh, and then ultimately for us all together uh, to learn from each other and learn how to support each other, not only at the community and the local level, but the state level and also the national level. Um, so thanks Miriam for allowing me to talk about the diversity and aquatics partnership that goes far beyond simply competitive swimming, but looking at how we can change and attack all of the barriers um, that are happening within the aquatics community at large. But then again, thank you, Mike, um, for seeing a local challenge, seeing a local problem, us being able to then call, right, to use the partnership with DIA and to also use the partnership with USA Swimming to say, hey, we have a unique way to help support this community and support Mike. So this is 
what we call poetry in motion, a local community calling to the national office saying we need help. And then for us to call to our support systems, our partners to say, hey, we need your help. And then for all of us to answer the call. Um, so if we can in the future help in any way, please just feel free to call myself or Noah. Um, we'll have your contacts uh, as well. But again, just thankful that we could connect the community, accept needs, and then provide in this unique way for the city of Buffalo. And thank you for that, Leland, um, and for laying that groundwork in understanding that for us and what we've set, set as um, all of that we're doing is beyond just swimming the laps in the pool, not beyond the competitiveness. And again, uh, I salute um, Coach Mike about seeing that vision and being and being able to to have as a anchor for the community uh, a way to help and support in that healing uh, more so. So let's talk about healing. Let's talk about empowering communities. And so I'm going to turn it over to our experts. You met them earlier, um, Dina Atler, Dr. Carol Penn, and Thaddeus Gamery, uh, to talk about making that connection. And I will say, when we started for Diversity Your Products, I really give credit to Thaddeus and the workings of what the tools from Dr. Carol Penn to making that connection towards healing and using the water for it. Um, I read a book that Thaddeus shared with us a long time ago. Um, it's called The Blue Mind. And it talked about how we are connected to water and all that we do. Of course, you know, Buffalo, New York is near one of the Great Lakes. Um, and there's a connectedness, there's a history with the water. And there's a connectedness of us and our, our attachment to the water and understanding that. Um, it's important that we see water water has been used we know as historically as a tool many times against black and brown communities um, but water really is a tool towards healing and that's what the blue mind uh taught me and i credit thaddeus for showing me many of the different tools yes i love that what you're saying victoria water is life it's absolutely is right you feel calmer when you're in and near the water but that's not always the case um, and so through this event, it is happening that uh, to allow for this, this to come to fruition. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Thaddeus Gamery and his crew to talk about really that connectiveness that we all have to the water. Thank you, Miriam. And I am going to share my screen. And hopefully I can do this. <laughs> Got it. Here we go. Tell me if you can see that. What are we looking at? Okay. So um, thank you, Miriam. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for you, uh, Leland Brown the Third, USA Swimming, and really and Coach good. Mike. I really uh, my heart really goes out good. to you and the community. Uh, we in Broward County. How I got into working with the Center for Mind Body Medicine is because of the response of the Center for Mind Body Medicine after a tragic event in Parkland. And that's how I got involved with the training and being a resource for the community to heal. Uh, Dr. Carol Penn was actually my supervisor and one of my instructors. So I was grateful to be able to connect with her around water. And in my journey for preparing for today, I was able to dig a little deeper into the amazing program you have there, the, the, uh, the City Swim Project and to understand the, some of the phrases and terms that you use, that swimming is more than a sport. And I felt that and seen that for myself and teaching skills to thrive in and out of the water. And swimming and water can have a direct impact in a positive way uh, for, for social emotional learning and development. And I also, while I was preparing for today, wanted to really connect and acknowledge the, the cultural, traditional connection, the land acknowledgement of the native people that came before and lived in this amazing space up there in Buffalo on the, on the Erie, Lake Erie, and also part of the Niagara, uh, Greater Niagara area. I also found out about the Underground Railroad and the significance about the Underground Railroad and how that connected 
uh, people uh, to freedom, using the waterway to swim or to navigate and to access freedom. And uh, Dr. Carol Penn, I'll pass it over to you for you to make a, a deeper connection on that historical uh, connection to water and to, and to Buffalo. All right, well, I will just share briefly about this, you know, just coming forward and thank you so much for doing the, the land acknowledgement. We all came from a point A to a point B. And the Underground Railroad was a way that during the period of having enslaved Africans here in these United States, people who, who wanted to escape the misery of their lives, the racialized terror that was being brought upon them at the time. And one of the places that people could escape to on the Underground Railroad, one of the places where people could be free or seek their freedom was in New York. You know, they had to get in New York, into Canada. And we know that Harriet Tubman, the great conductor of the Underground Railroad, the great captain was, she had a principal role in that in bringing people from the racialized terror of being an enslaved human being toward an opportunity for freedom in places north of that. And Buffalo played a very important part of that. And that is how part of the African-American community came to be settled in Western New York. And then post slavery, post the Civil War, there was another opportunity called the Great Migration North, which took place between 1915 and 1970, whereupon six million African Americans escaped the yet ongoing racialized terror of the Southern United States in the Jim Crow era, and again came North. And Buffalo was also a place where people settled and stopped. So if you talk to the families that are here, you could probably go back, some of them going all the way back to the Underground Railroad in terms of how their ancestors came to land in Buffalo, while others going back to the Great Migration between 1915 and 1970, how those families came to land in Buffalo. So that's all I'll say about that. But just, you know, again, as we get into this and we get into um, a little bit about epigenetics and the background of how we carry certain experiences as well as certain um, disease states, chronic illness and, and both physical and mental health, it's a part of that story. It's a part of that story of migration and displacement for how we come to be and how some of these things are still unfolding in us on the genetic level. So um, I will I pass could just on. Add in, If I yes. could just add in one thing. Um, so I'm Canadian. I've lived here for quite a while, but my family is all across the river right there in Hamilton. Um, and I grew up thinking that um, we didn't have any problems like United States had. We were perfect. That's the Canadian myth. So when I see that crossing over to Canada to freedom, um, boy, we are uncovering and really looking at um, how we've treated people as well. So I think that, you know, sometimes like when we have these events too, um, here's the call to action to be honest and to learn and to really partner. So, um, and question our history and what we've been learning and all that we have yet to learn. Thank you, Dina. That's a, an important contribution to, to just see what is so, so we yes. can understand where we are and how we got here. And the some facts about the Underground Railroad in Greater Niagara, and I found fact number three really stood out to me, is that a African-American waitstaff uh, who were born in the South, head waiter John Morrison offered ferry, ferry freedom seekers across the Niagara River to Canada. 
So this explains or this highlights that black people were navigating the waters, were swimming across the waters at a time. So it helps to understand there was a connection to water. There was an ability to interact with water in it as they sought freedom. And that's important when we're as a diverse and aquatics network to be able to tell the truth about the history, to be able to be comfortable embracing what is so as a way of not just staying in the past, but also being able to transform the present based on the knowledge of the past. And we're a network to help save lives. And our mission the diverse in aquatics is to dismiss stereotypes and false myths about black, indigenous, and people of color, abilities to swim and participate in aquatic activities. And City Swim Project and, and Mike and all his coaches are, are doing that on a grand scale. And we want to share information and resources and knowledge with culturally and linguistically diverse communities of color, preserve and educate about the diverse and often hidden history of black, indigenous, aquatic accomplishments and culture. And pr promote the benefits of aquatics to future generations and curb drowning. So by telling the truth and connecting people to the water and seeing it as a bigger and more important resource than just swimming, for recreation or sport, that is absolutely true, but also for uh, restoring uh, ancient traditions, healing current upsets, fitness and well being. Um, and and uh, Miriam, if you'd like to say more about diversity aquatics. Yes, uh, I definitely will. And I think this is what we're all working towards is that we're trying to, and I see Mike doing this on a daily basis up in Buffalo, is to address and eliminate those barriers. Um, through this th free event, and I really commemorate Mike making it a free event, and making less barriers for the community to be able to have an opportunity uh, to make that connectedness to the water um, by the vendors that he's bringing in is to eliminate those barriers that are in front of, of utilizing and making that connectedness to, to the water. In addition, all of us here and through this event, it is for all of us to really help and increase water safety and drowning prevention. So, of course, with the help and the partners that are here, we are going to address water safety. We are addressing um, drowning prevention techniques um, and, and educating the community on not only just the water safety, but the history, as Thaddeus uh, illuminated earlier, and that connect deep connectedness to the water. Um, of course, always creating ethical opportunities for everyone. Uh, because really right now, what we found out too in the midst of planning for all this is that Buffalo, some of the pools are closing this summer. And that has a big effect on that connectedness to the water, to be able to come to have a moment to not only learn about and be aware of water safety, but to excel in aquatic opportunities. Um, that also makes that impact on curbing the drowning disparities. So this event that Mike has created a foundation of is addressing all of these things and more for the community of Buffalo. Thank you very much. Could I just offer two thoughts? Um, I just want to say, actually, that all of the, the pools are closed except for two indoor pools. And you know, if people go elsewhere. But I also, um, I'm Vicki Ross, we're very lesser, we're very honored to be invited to be a part of this event on Wednesday, uh, on that, uh, Friday, Friday. But I did want to say my sister was a paraplegic, she was technically quadriplegic, and she swam, she actually swam a half a mile. She did regularly laps, was part of making her the strong independent person that she was. And the other thing is when we do, as the Western New York Peace Center, we do Camp Peace Prints, we, uh, it's an alternative day camp. And we, when we finally figured out how to bring the kids swimming, it was such a critical piece in our social justice and in their facing their fears and just a beautiful, you know, 
experiential learning that I just could I can't say enough about. So I just want to thank you so much for your approach. Thank you for sharing that, Vicky. Thank you for sharing the story. And and Mike, would you like to say a little bit more about how your approach to um, City Swim project and how it's different or how it's been so successful before we go into more of the details of the Blue Mindfulness. Wow, uh, I guess the qu bigger question that maybe be easier to answer is how are we not different um, from any traditional USA Swim Club? Um, our, our sport is traditionally 60% female, 40% male. Uh, my program is 53% male. Uh, our sport is roughly 70% or 75% white and 25% other diverse backgrounds. My program is 90% diverse. Um, our sport is less than, I believe, Leland, correct me if I'm wrong, we're less than 2% considered low income registered with USA Swimming. Uh, my program is 85% considered low income. Um, and what we do is we try to remove any of those barriers, whether it's language, uh, finance, transportation, uh, or anything like that. We try and find a solution. Our goal is to have everybody being safe around the water and knowing how to swim. It's the only sport, and people say this all the time, it's the only sport that if you know how to do it, it can save your life. So that's what we promote. And we've been able to champion this through some tremendous partnerships, uh, some tremendous leadership. You know, I know I'm the face of the program, but the reality is, is that I have a tremendous staff behind me from my full-time directors. Uh, my director of support services, my director of business development, my learn to swim director, and my head coach, to our swim instructor staff, to my board of directors, and all the volunteers that, that, that help within the program, too. It doesn't happen just because of me. You know, you don't get to a, a 400 kids annually, you know, coming through the program because of one individual. It, it takes that village, and... I've been fortunate enough to get that village built around me. So happy to hear you say that, Coach Mike, about the village, because that is exactly uh, our approach to healing. It's a community-wide approach. And that's how I was brought into the Center for Mind-Body Medicine as a swim coach and as a, a high school swim coach and a, um, a mentor, but I, I was a formerly a, a substitute teacher, but I wasn't a teacher at the time. So um, yes, it's a village. And um, there's a level of, of, of wellness and, and healing that's available in the water. Uh, it is absolutely a phenomenal place. And we were able to connect the mind-body medicine practices to the water. And we also want um, um, a lot of the people of color to know that there are people that are practicing mindfulness, that we do exist uh, as yoga instructors and Qigong instructors. And my, uh, my, uh, my friend and my former supervisor, Dr. Carol Penn, is a Qigong instructor herself uh, and, um, and brings Qigong into the, the work of, of healing and, and blue mindfulness. And um, Dina Adler also does uh, artwork and she'll talk more about that herself. But can, can we, uh, can I ask Dr. Penn to lead us in a little bit of a, a experiential for all the people on this webinar to have a, an experience of, of what we do. And even though we're on land, we will connect to a, a, a theme of water and continue the theme of, of, of water is our medicine and we are water. So Dr. Penn, can I pass it to you? Absolutely. So I'm going to invite everyone to participate in about a three to four minute experiment with the breath. And I will guide okay. you through it. Three, if you feel comfortable, 
continue joining with us. If at any point you feel uncomfortable, simply, you know, stop where you are. However, continue to observe. Observe what's coming up for you, what's arising in your feelings, what maybe some emotions might be bubbling up. And then I'm going to ask you to notice and maybe we might have time for one or two people to share. So we're going to do a little breath work now and a little bit of just opening our hearts and relaxing. So I'm going to invite everyone to sit or stand or even lie down in a comfortable position. And I'm going to describe the experience from a seated position, but please feel free to adjust as you need to. I'm going to ask you to uncross your legs unless you're sitting kind of in a tailor sit, if that's what's comfortable for you. Otherwise, uncross your legs and let your feet rest on the floor. Take a nice deep breath in, let it out with a sigh. And for those that are comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes. You don't need to see me, you just need to hear me. And if that feels safe, right, and good, I invite you to allow your eyes to stay closed or you can open them at any point or hold them in a open but soft, gentle gaze. Mm. And just see if you can invite the muscles around your eyes and your face and your lips to become soft and full, even allow your tongue to relax. Mm, I invite you to take a nice deep breath in through the nose and let that breath out through the nose. Or try this breath, a nice deep breath in through the nose. Now let that breath out with a sigh through your open, through your nose. So in through the nose, out through the nose, or in through the nose and out through the mouth. And just notice which breath feels more comfortable to you and stay with that breath throughout this little experiment. So let's just take a few more breaths just like that. In through the nose, out through the nose, or in through the nose, out through the mouth. Ah, now if you'd like, I invite you to rest one hand on your belly. And this time, as you breathe in, I'd like you to breathe in and say to yourself the word soft as you breathe in. And as you breathe out, say to yourself the word belly. So we breathe soft belly, soft belly, soft belly at your own rhythm, rate, and timing. Go ahead and take a few more breaths, just like that, using the phrase soft belly. If your mind starts to wander, come back to paying attention to your breath or to the phrase soft belly. If thoughts are bubbling up, ah, thank the thought for sharing and see if you can watch that thought drift by like a cloud drifting by in the sky. And we come back to the breath and to soft belly, soft belly, soft belly. See what else you can soften and relax. Letting go of the busyness of the day and the effort it took to get here. Now let's take one more deep collective breath together. 
And let that breath go, even with a sigh if you'd like, or a yawn. And stretching, still keeping the eyes closed if that feels good to do so. Your body knows exactly how it wants to move. See if you can find a little smile that wants to bubble up from the inside, making its way to your lips and from your lips to your eyes. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I'm real curious. Did anybody notice a change from before they started breathing to when they finished the breathing? And if so, yeah, we've got some reactions, some thumbs up. You can also put your reaction in the chat. And can we have one or two people share what they noticed about doing that? And all reactions are welcome. So we have Vicki. Let's see, should I, can I call on someone? Um, Nikki Lopez, can I call on you? Did you, were you able to participate? Uh, yes. Um, I, I always enjoy doing soft belly breathing. So it, it does um, allow me to kind of ground and focus and relax. Wonderful. Yes, and that's one of the things that it can do is to allow you to ground and focus. So it's really good for mental clarity or increasing awareness around that. So Mike is saying, Coach Mike, he's noticing his shoulders are more relaxed. Very nice, very nice. And so that's just with, you know, two reactions with, you know, a short little experiment. It takes about three minutes for our physiology to notice a difference and begin to shift also for our blood pressure to begin to regulate and also for our blood glucose levels to begin to relate, regulate. So, you know, the breath is very, very powerful and transformative. So Thaddeus, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Penn. And forgive me for moving the slides around. My, my little touch pad on the, is very sensitive. And I'd like to, um, and thank you for that mindful moment and breath. And I'd like to invite uh, Dina Adler to give us a little uh, insight into how the other forms of mindfulness work that you uh, have practiced and, and, and how that relates to students um, and how, how it benefits young people. Thank you. And I think that this visual on the screen is a perfect one because you see the overlapping circles and then all the new shades uh, that also get created. Um, and so, um, you know, I first want to just also add, Thaddeus, you know, you worked with me in a small group in Florida um, and many of us stepped in with some fear in the water. So, you know, our whole fantasy was to be that the divers and it's uh, recognizing, wow, what an invitation. I think we have heard this already uh, in our talk, what the water brings us. Um, and the overlapping part that we're realizing too then is all the different uh, realms and modalities that can bring healing and awareness. So when we think of water, we think of um, movement. We just did one with the breath. Um, even you see my association with color and with art. It's a whole nother level to, um, we may, you know, think something and have a concept or an image uh, and then kind of even bring it to paper. And <clears throat> the important part too of all our development. So even like in this diagram, um, it's my relationship to myself, um, my family around me, my community. So it really just keeps growing and growing as well as uh, all that I'm learning in a day. Um, you know, when we put our, in the breathing exercise, when we put our hand on our belly and we can put our hand on our heart. So now we can also then get our full connection to our mind-body connection and how important that is um, for these concepts of what we're learning, what mental health is, is more than just me knowing what emotion I'm feeling. Um, and I, uh, you know, we had mentioned before, I see these words Broward County, um, you know, we're hoping that we're using this pre for prevention, um, but how important it is also at the time of tragedy, grief and loss. 
um, and how um, all of these modalities uh, can bring us to a collective state of healing. Um, what I love about this chart, Thaddeus, is that um, you see on the right-hand side, all those lessons, all the different kinds of things of mindfulness, um, the breathing, the mindful art, uh, even down there is mindful eating. So every everything that we do, when we can add to this mindfulness place of coming into it, what it grows, and really thinking of the mindfulness as just a place of no judgment, um, but how hard that is to even grow to get to that place. Thank you, Dina Adler. <laughs> that was pretty, very profoundly uh, healing just to hear you make the connection and your description of making it. And the intersectionality of all this as it comes to water and breath and moving the body and, and practicing uh, self-care skills uh, learning to swim is a self-care skill. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a personal development skill. It's it 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 offers so much. And then to continue to swim, even we have many many swimmers who stop swimming. And I don't mean to swim competitively, but swimming for the joy of it, swimming for the well knit being of it, staying connected to the water in a new way, not a competitive way. If that that career has served you well, but now it's, you know, put it to rest. So we're going to continue to advance and show the water connection, which was scientifically proven by a study done by Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, that we are water and water is our medicine. And Dr. Wallace J. Nichols came to Broward County in 2018, and he hosted the Blue Mind Summit and a collection of us attended and we learn the science of what happens to the body when it's in, on, and underwater. Many of us in the aquatic world, we already know that. And we know that there's some physiological adaptations, but the, there's a deeper awareness that was provided on, a, on a, a, a profoundly healing way. And that <laughs> that slide is, it, it makes me laugh because uh, I was using, uh, uh, underwater meditation with a doctor of oriental medicine who was teaching qigong and we were having a lot of fun underwater it looks like very serious but we were able he was doing healing and he was he actually helping me heal some injuries and using acupuncture and then we decided to take it and, and he was my qigong instructor and then we decided to take it underwater and it was profound but it makes me laugh when i see it because it was a really fun and, and pleasant time but there's a connection to water that produces a variety of, uh, of um, neurological, physiological um, uh, results, and the body can respond, and, and, and it can support, it can mitigate uh, certain harms and certain uh, things that are going on in the body. It can restore, it can, it, it can loosen, enlighten, and soften. Just like when you're in water where you feel the buoyancy, it makes on land, you might have felt a little stiff and in the water, now it starts to loosen up. There's so many things that physiologically happen. And at the same time, a healing process happens in a deeper way because there's when you also add the breath. And when it's intentional and it's guided, there's a whole nother level of wellness that can be uh, experienced. This is a, a healing circle we've created in 2018. Some of the people in this circle are school teachers, school counselors, parents uh, for Broward County and Broward County schools. Some of these people are adult learn to swim and they floated on their back and looked at the sun, sky, blue sky, for the first time in their lives and born and raised in Fort Lauderdale, Florida but not had, had not swum because they were afraid. So the blue mindfulness approach and what, and the mission of diversity and aquatics is to promote a trauma informed, anxiety sensitive, culturally competent and restorative justice approach to the water, to have a community wide healing, to create a village. That's our village. 
that unique village. We created that space right there, right then. And we connected. We feel safe, supported. We've had fun. We were curious. We were calm. We were connected. We had compassion for self and others in that moment. And that experience has been replicated again and again and again. And some people on this call have been in that circle <laughs> just, just recently. Right, Nikki Lopez? <laughs> so part of uh, diversity in aquatics and the, um, the hope of this and the, the intention of the Blue Mindfulness approach is to disrupt the myths and bring more awareness of who and who not, who is and who isn't a swimmer, who has access to water that can be healing or restorative. So these are just a, collective, a collection of images of things that we have done as a community, as an organization, partnerships with the Boys and Girls Club, local aquatic centers, the National uh, Association of Black Scuba Divers, and uh, different organizations that were doing amazing work and bringing kids into this water to scuba dive. Now I'm just gonna move to these slides because I wanna really imprint on you how is, who is it, who is a swimmer? Who is a scuba diver? Who is a lifeguard? And I see a hand is up. Michelle, you have a hand up. And what does it mean to become a lifeguard? What are the benefits? What is what 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 are some of the results and, and achievements you can gain personally as a lifeguard? So this journey into a healing relationship and a restorative justice relationship and a personal growth relationship with water puts a young people and any people of any age actually in a position to consider being a professional rescuer and a lifeguard. And what are the growth benefits that can come from there? Especially if you approach it from a place of calm, feeling connected, feeling confident, and feeling even challenged. Some more images of lifeguards. So the, the Diversity in Aquatics has collected uh, information and research from a collection of organizations and institutions and researchers to, to be in a position to discuss and to look at the history of swimming and who isn't and who isn't a, who is and who isn't a swimmer and to disrupt any false myths around that so that people can have access to the water again and feel entitled, feel belonging, feel safe, feel uh, uh, um, that it's a part of the culture. So here's another image to also restore the truth about who is and who is a swimmer, who is and who is not an aquatic professional, who is and who is not a lifesaver. So let me just say from now on, who who is? We're gonna say who is. So take a moment to read that.
while we're watching these images, try to see if you can notice your breath, how the breath is the constant companion. The breath is our constant companion on land and in water. So one of the ways that we work together is that we will teach that soft belly breath on the land. And then of course we take it in the water to further enhance the freedom and the relaxation of being in the water. And we also use that soft belly breathing as a way in on the land to help quell fears. So we've had people who were saying, oh no, I'm not getting in the water. After we do the soft belly breathing, a little bit of meditation, then they feel relaxed enough and safe enough to go into the water and have an experience in the water. So we're always making this bridge and this marriage between the two. And uh, Thaddeus, I have to say, these um, slides and these images are, are wonderful. And we are in fact 70% water. So we are that thing. And far too many people are fearful of the water and far too many drown on a daily basis. I read some staggering figure that kind of blew my mind just the other day. So, you know, bringing it all together. And I teach meditation and contemplative movement like Qigong and yoga from three to 103. Guess what? Swimming also three to 103 and even younger. So as a mom, my first mommy and me, my son was six months old when we got in the water, mommy and me swim together. So this is something that's lifelong and the skills are transferable and very compatible. Thank you, Dr. Penn. So you can see here in these images that there was a lot of fun and there was a lot of uh, um, uh, media, uh, film, uh, books, promotions around creating a fun and happy activity around water. So part of restoring a connection to water if for people that have lost it and for um, especially black folks who and it's quite often said in the black community, well, black folks don't swim. Where, where'd that myth come from? And why does that myth exist? Well, it, during the early part of the the 20th century, there was a lot of promotion about who were and who were not swimmers. And the white culture re received a, an abundance of attention and activity around building pools and water and having access. And there was a, there was a deficit where it came to black people. So as this was happening in Fort Lauderdale Beach and spring break was starting, this is what was happening in other places. And even when it wasn't an official policy of, of creating a segregated pool, they created other barriers and disruptions. So there was a, a disruption to a normal process of developing a, a swimming culture for many, many, many African-Americans. But then there were exceptions. But I'm gonna move through the rest of these slides a little quicker, but just to say that the, gen the generational trauma that is passed on during a time when segregation was legal or de facto and people felt going to aquatic environments, it can stay in the body, affect how you feel today, and it can be passed on generationally, as Dr. Penn said, epigenetically. So it's the expression of the gene. It's not a permanent encoded, but it's how it's expressed at the moment. And it's a, it's a response to, to something that is dangerous or fearful. So Dr. King was asked to come to a pool in uh, St. Augustine, Florida to help organize a, 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 uh, a wade-in. But he was also a lover of the water himself. And he would go to the Bahamas and swim. And he was a swimmer. Here's an image of him after he got into a pool full of white people 
and they all left when he got in, even though there was no segregation policy in the Bahamas. Here's an image of the, the protests. Many people have seen this, that Dr. King helped to organize, but he was also, uh, it was so dangerous at that time that they told him he should leave. And this incident helped to create this or push forward the civil rights legislation in 1965. We also had experienced uh, the impact of a, a, a of uh, someone feeling entitled to tell black people what to do in their pool and calling the police on them. Or, and one of our members is here today and she experienced it in just 2020. And we created an, a restorative justice training experience. Training, so we actually had, we taught people how to be mindful, how to breathe together as a community. And, and then we brought everyone into the water to be restored. And we're doing it again uh, this, this month. This image I got from the, from the uh, Niagara uh, cultural um, and uh, cultural and society, if I'm saying that right. And it shows uh, a black family at Niagara Falls uh, feeling connected. And I, I thought that was a powerful image I, I wanted to share because I had a powerful experience of, of being connected and joy and healing in the water myself at Niagara Falls in 2020. So I was actually in the Buffalo area. <laughs> that's me and that's my son. And that is the end of the slide. Just to, to, to emphasize, to close on this, that the, the value of water was so significant that people fought and died for it. And this is something, this natural resource is something that's available. And for many, it starts with getting over fear and it starts in a pool. It starts in a pool to be able to start to, to loosen the fear so that they can have an experience of something like that. And I'm gonna turn this back over uh, to uh, Miriam and Dr. Penn right now and I'm going to stop sharing my my uh, my screen. Very powerful images there, Thaddeus. And and I think that's important. And what this and the events that are happening is for a community to see themselves in the water and working with communities. I think a lot of times when we go when we do events and we are curators. Uh, we, we're not mindful about the history, and that's what we wanted to share today, the history of the community and the connectiveness with the community and having doing that work with the community, meaning that as Mike, how many vendors do you guys have as a part of your event that is working with you in this aquatics, um, this aquatics event? Uh, on paper right now, we are at, I believe it's 15. And we invited about just, just less than 50. So for our first run at this, I'm, I'm real happy with the outcome. That's huge. That's huge. And that is a true partnership <laughs> with communities. Because what Mike has created with those 15 partners is gateways into different avenues of interest from the community to be included into the healing process. Um, and I'll talk more about the event and that connectiveness. Uh, Dr. Carol Penn and Dina, talk about what what is also an on-ramp for those who aren't able to get into the water. Once they come and they're, they're connected, how can you still participate in a, an event like this, in a healing? Well, absolutely. So again, seriously, something for everyone. And the basis of what Dina and I will be doing while those who feel ready or, and desire want to get in the water with Thaddeus, 
we're we're gonna you know depending upon the numbers we're gonna play off each other and we're gonna include some other activities from the mind body continuum so i'll be working with breath movement and dina will be working with with art therapy and breath he showed the breath is the key and we will dance and play with each other or we might be able if the group is large enough we'll do two simultaneous experiences and then we'll swap. So we'll see, so we'll, we'll see. So again, something for everyone that again is going to, and when you leave working with Dina and I, if we you know, had all the time in the world, I know at the end of that experience, some people would be feeling more relaxed and then they'd be ready to try the water. So that's the idea just to you know, really prep you to be, to be open, to be relaxed, to be easy, to feel safe and to have agency and access toward following the breadcrumbs to your own soul so that you can do it for yourself. Dina, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Yeah, um, you know, when you think about uh, how art relates, so what I love is watercolor. So we're actually using water to make the art. Uh, and many people don't like watercolor because it doesn't give you the control that maybe some other art forms have. So it's another way of, uh, it's almost like that Niagara Falls picture with the, you know, and all of a sudden there's your rainbow. So sometimes what the art experience can also do is just uh, invite you to play um, and, and be a little comfortable and see what happens when I add water and, and there's an explosion of color. Um, or if I'm not getting the control and just using the imagery, um, even from this whole presentation, the metaphors of uh, being at a bridge or crossing. So art is another way to um, bring all of this together. And I have to say, Carol, when you first did the breathing, and I like you, Mike, it was right there in my shoulders. So I think that when we, we use the breath and the body and art, um, you're, it's just also uh, getting that awareness of, wow, like letting go of more tension <laughs> through all these mediums. Absolutely. And I love that what is being provided and Mike, the location, of this uh, event is a beautiful location about what you've been able to share with us. Um, lots of light, lots, it's the center of the community. It's putting the school at the center of the community. Um, can you talk more about the what somebody could expect once they, they, they sign up, they're coming on Friday at 4 p.m. it starts. What can someone experience at this event? We talked about the vendors and some of what Dr. Carol Penn and Adina said, what else can we do? What can somebody else have? So obviously Dr. Penn and Dina have, have talked about what they'll be doing uh, upstairs in the uh, atrium and gymnasium. Um, <clears throat> we are still working on trying to identify a uh, CPR instructor that can be there too to uh, teach the community about hands-only CPR in case of emergency. Uh, so we hope to have that there as well. Uh, but the, the, the vendors that we have coming are, you know, some of the, the, the great services and resources in the community. So um, give a rundown of that. Uh, we've got United Healthcare, we've got the Rest Restoration Society, Buffalo Urban League, uh, a children's book character called Giraffe, Crisis Services, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, talking about healthy corner store initiatives, uh, the Police Athletic League, Confident Girl Mentoring, Willie Hutch Jones, Educational and Sports Programming, uh, Erie County Department of Social Services, um, and then Thaddeus, Dina, and Dr. Penn are gonna have a table as well. My organization, City Swim Project, will have a, a table. Uh, William and Emsley YMCA, and then uh, it also sounds like um, Canisius College in partnership with a doctor out of Penn State is going to have a literacy uh, table going on as well. So um, we're, we're really trying to address the needs that we identify as priorities in, in the city of Buffalo specifically. Uh, what I know, uh, my students are going through at McKinley, what they have experienced in the past year. Uh, 
you know, they're all on, on a, a different spectrum, you know, basically. Some are feeling anger, some are feeling sadness, some are experiencing fear. You know, there's a lot of different things going on with my kids, and I'm trying to find the resources to address all of those needs. Wow. Um, absolutely. And that's that's the special part with working with communities. And I, I, I continue to emphasize that and continue to salute you, Coach Mike, in, in that. Because a lot of times, as we've said, is that if we miss the communities, we miss the needs that the community is in need of at that time. And what you've laid out with all the different organization is different on-ramps for the community to have that connection to each other first, and then that connection to the water and to the history that they have connected to it, through Buffalo and the pride and the, the chance to say, this is my neighbor, I'm, we're here together um, through this. And I really do, you're setting a model for that. And so I wanna take it over to Leland Brown the third how can how can this be mimicked in other communities? How can we have this type of way that connector to communities um, from your standpoint and working with so many different communities on different levels towards um, you know getting them to see the joys of swimming as Thaddeus outlined for us? Yes, I will start off the answer of this question by putting one of these in the camera and realizing that in reality, these have created more connection, but more dissonance amongst all of us because it's easier to send a text message. It's easier to call. It's easier to email. It's easier to, to, to send a LinkedIn message. But in reality, uh, connection is all about being there, um, being there and understanding historically uh, how things affected the community, but then also connection is about actually walking. Um, what, regardless of if we believe in uh, the religion um, of Christianity, the one profound thing that the revolutionary in Christ did was walk. That's it. He was amongst the people. He figured out what they needed, and then he answered their beck and call by connecting and then fulfilling the need that the people had. And so what's most important about this work that we do, that is inclusion work, that's providing equity for people, providing, uh, 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 providing the tools or empowerment that people need, is first we have to walk in the communities just as Mike is being there, asking the questions of what does the community itself need, um, but then also understanding historically the needs of the community as we've done today, right? And we continue to, to, to do in our work. But once you have a historical understanding of the community, and then you have a present day understanding of what the community needs. Now you have solutions and the solutions are community driven solutions. In research, we call it community based participatory research in which the community participates in, its, in finding its own solutions. So when you create the solutions, the solutions now are, are community driven, but now we know that they're need based. The community is saying we need it. And, and so, I, First, understanding connection is understanding the historical, right, analysis of what's going on. Second is going into the community, actually being there, figuring out their needs. But then the third piece of connection is how then do we do we connect these solutions and getting the information to the community that we're here and we're available for them? Because there's so much great work being done that's being done from a historical, right, and also from an intentional purpose-driven way, but it's not making its way to the community itself. And so if we're going to say that we're going to connect, we have to actually be there. And how, how are we there? Mike said, I'm going to pass out flyers. And I'm not just going to pass out 600 during Juneteenth. I'm going to come outside again, and I'm going to pass out 400 on another day, right? So like he was actually there, walking with the people, passing out, connecting them uh, with them, letting them know that not only was he a resource, but that he is somebody that's there for them. Um, and so if we're going to talk about connection, I think it's very simple. And I don't want to trivialize uh, the problem here, but I want to say put these down and instead of utilizing these or technology to do the work that we say we're going to do, be there. 
And if you start by being there and you're there every single day and you take steps to be there every single day, then at the end of 365 days, you've helped 365 people or you've had 365 programs or you've changed 365 lives or communities. And so if you don't do anything every day, but put this down and step into one community, have one conversation, connect with one person that needs you, then you're doing the work. Do the work instead of right always talking about it we can embrace and do the work and that's what this that's what is so important about connection just being there and doing it beautifully said i agree with michelle you better say it <laughs> um but that's that's the truth of what what it is and to have this model of what has been created and why we're having today's webinar is to show the way to show that it is that legwork, the walk with the community in order to make things happen. Um, and I think through our through our guest panelists um, and these last few minutes that we have, um, I want to open it up to our audience and allow if there's any questions that are from the audience, how the hows, the what's, the whys, more. Um, to connect with this amazing group here to be able to ask any questions uh, that you have um, through. <laughs> and one thing I'll just add as people are putting up, oh, yep, Kurt, go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? So greetings from New Zealand, everybody. I'm down here um, just south of Auckland. Uh, didn't know about this, so I just had to jump in and I have another meeting that I have to get to, but I really want to see this because ironically, I'm actually doing something for Drowning Prevention Day, World Drowning Prevention Day, talking about this exact same thing and talking to the social sector and raising awareness that there is a connection between the two, that drowning prevention um, aquatics and the social sector have a lot to share and a lot to cooperate on. So I'm the next meeting I have right now is actually talking about that event. So it's really ironic that this is happening now and would love to connect with anybody here. And um, some of you from Diversity Aquatics all know that I've been communicating with you guys for a while and very keen to connect because globally, I think this is the more conversations I have, I see this as a movement that not only diversity in aquatics, but reclaiming our relationship with the water. And that's a lot of what we're talking about down here, especially with indigenous rights, um, especially with ethnic communities going back and looking at what is our relationship with the water and we have a right to interact with the water. So, sorry, it's not so much a question, but I have tons of questions and I would love to connect with you all, but I just wanna say that we're here and we're here to cooperate and we're here to engage and if anybody, wants to reach out and um, have a chat, more than happy to do so. Thanks. Thank you, Kurt. And for those who don't know, uh, Kurt has, as he explained just a small bit, but he does a lot of big work um, over in New Zealand. Um, and salute to you as well, Kurt, in the work that you're doing in that area to bring further awareness. And I love, same thing, I agree with Michelle, reclaiming, re reclaiming our relationship back to the water yeah. is so important. Kurt, is there a way we can get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll put, um, Diversion Aquatics has my contact info, but I'll put my email up in the chat as well. And again, and LinkedIn, I'm always on LinkedIn as well. So Keen to connect in any way and discuss. Are you still manually doing all your social media marketing posts? Gosh, you know what? There's a secret. There's an easier way. Also, Miriam, I just wanted to say, as a part of that connection, please lean on USA Swimming, lean on Diversity and Aquatics, and when Mike has the time, lean on people like Mike to pick their brains to figure out what they're doing, how they're doing it. Uh, uh, that work. And once you're interested in connecting with people and being where they are, it's our duty to connect you with the resources to get it done. And so when Mike said, hey, I'm in tune with my community so much so that we need to do this event, it made so much sense to just 
get off on the phone and call Miriam and say, hey, I think there's a way for us to help. And so with that, um, please use us as a resource. We are the conduits to providing in any way that we can. Um, please feel free to reach out to me or Miriam when you're thinking about doing something like this for your community. I'm gonna drop my contact in the email as well. And Kurt, thank you so much for the uh, ad on LinkedIn. I'll make sure that I uh, get with you. Absolutely, um, with that. Any other questions from our audience for today? Go. We've got several emails being passed out. One thing I do want to make, uh, while if anybody doesn't have a question, but just to make that connection that is there are certain layers that being caught that people that organizers should be cognizant of when making the connection to um, your aquatic programming. And, you know, today we laid out certain ones, but make sure to have it as fun. Um, I think if we see the understanding and that connection um, from the fun aspect and that historical model aspect is so very important when making those connections to communities and, and doing your aquatic events and having different um, avenues of connections are so very important. Um, I got asked this in Brooklyn, New York. I was there two weeks ago and it was like, my child is so fearful of the water. And we, and we, I asked, how is the, how is the child approaching the water? Is it straight to swim lessons? Have you had conversations beforehand? Have, what is, what makes fun in the water? Um, and what Thaddeus has explained today with uh, Dina and Dr. Penn is different ways to connect to the water through breathing exercises, through watercolors, and being able to have that sensory um, just stillness before going into a place that is unknown. Um, and we have to realize that it is a large unknown in that area. So being creative, doing the walk, making those connections can help you have an ear towards being able to address the needs in your community and listening to what are the barriers, what are the individual barriers, and what are the systemic barriers towards enjoying the water fully. And I see some things came up in our chat. I love this. Everybody is connecting through email on here. That's what it's about. We are each other's village as we go through this. I think the connection through this today is all of us to be um, understanding we've got each other, right? We're all in this together. No matter how you're approaching it, where you're approaching it, across the globe, good morning to you, Kurt, and uh, <laughs> all over that we're all water, right? That's what I'm, I'm taking away. We're all water, we're all connected um, through it, and we're all about and making a better place for our communities through that avenue. So I do wanna say thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Coach Mike in leading the way through this event. Um, and I wish everyone safe travels up there to Buffalo um, and a successful event to each of you as you're doing this. Any last minute thoughts from our panelists before we go? But just that I hope that everyone will come out and if you, even if you can't be there, please pass the information along to invite someone who could attend in person on Friday. I'm looking forward to meeting everyone and being in person for sure, for sure. Thank you, thank you, Miriam and Coach Mike and Coach Stadius and Dina. And where is Mr. Brown, Mr. Leland Brown? All his words, there he is, words of wisdom and Noah. I mean, this has really been um, just delightful. And I hope it'll be impactful and transformative for all who are able to attend. I look forward to being in Buffalo and supporting the City Swim Project and connecting with Coach Mike and everyone else that's gonna be in attendance. And thank you all for giving us a great send off and connecting here on this uh, uh, internet uh, modality. <laughs> 
but uh, it does translate. You, you can um, experience some healing even though you're, you're on Zoom. We've learned that, that it actually does, it can be effective. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Leslie Stewart. Thank you, Thaddeus, for that, uh, that ad. I will say that I'm unable to attend uh, Buffalo, but this virtual uh, invite was definitely a good introspective look. Um, and there are definite takeaways. And um, I appreciate the virtual. So um, best of everything in Buffalo, uh, remain safe and um, sending you all the grace. Thank you, Leslie. To our audience members, thank you so much for being in attendance. Uh, to Dr. Carol, to Thaddeus, to Dina, um, thank you so much for sharing your energy, your wisdom, your insights, but more importantly, sharing your ability to heal with us. Uh, we know that trauma transfers, and so taking it in, but also helping take it off of other people is so important. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, Noah, thank you for being here. Uh, last but not least, Dr. Miriam Lynch deserves several round of applauses uh, for all of the work that she does uh, to make a way and then get out of the way. She's not a woman that makes a way and stays in the way. She makes a way and gets out of it. Um, I truly appreciate all that you are. Um, a diamond, not in the rough, just a diamond. Uh, and so thank you for what you do. And then Mike, thank you for bringing the community together as well. Thank you, everybody. I uh, certainly appreciate all the kind words everybody has said about me, but the reality is, is that this is about the community and the needs of the community right now. And we've got a lot of pain up here that, that needs to be addressed. And it hits close to home on, on a lot of different levels, just not from you know my teaching at McKinley High School. But when I started the City Swim Project and I was the only coach with 15 kids, my very first donor was Fire Commissioner Garnell Whitfield. Uh, he donated $5,000 to the program and promised us an AED at every location we went to. And his mother was the oldest victim in the massacre. So we are doing this out of recognition of the events of May 14th and all the needs that our community has. And we're hoping that Garnell might be able to join us. He's gonna give me a call tomorrow, but uh, he might be joining us on Friday for the event. We're, hope, we're hopeful of that. I see a couple of people in the chat are asking for the flyer for to the Friday event. So I don't know if we've captured those emails to make sure that they can get them. Yes, I got the emails. I will send out uh, the flyer, Mike, that you sent us for the 8th. It is also on our different social media channels um, as well to help inform our communities uh, through our different aquatic entities of the event as well. Oh, Mike, thank you for sharing the flyer here. Beautiful. Yay. <laughs> Look at that. Teamwork. Dream work. There we go. Perfect stuff. Some people asked if it will be virtual. Um, unfortunately, no, it will not be virtual. Uh, but on the 25th, we will go virtual with uh, an event that we're doing for World Drowning Prevention Day, which is very similar. Uh, but we also just want to be cognizant in going virtual because this is a healing space. As Mike said, that this is a space, a safe space for the community to be able to come and heal. And that's the center of what is this event. We've talked a lot about different mechanisms, but absolutely with what Mike said is that that is the center focus. Um, and so it will not be shown um, live stream to allow that intimate space, to allow people to come as they are needed and to do what is needed into that space. And I think that's important for all of us to remember as we're doing healing. Well, 
It is 7.05. I do want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Again, thank you all so much for everything. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us who have shared our emails um, on here. I also will send a follow-up to the link once it's provided so that you can share with your community the flyer and this recording. Thank you all. Have a good night.